on that happy note, I used to be on a, a board in the Netherlands. It was really hip We had a business that was in Russia <coughs> back in the uh, mid late 90s. And one of the guys that was late, always late for the board meetings, he was a very wealthy guy who lived in uh, the, the Dutch Antilles. And when he ever come late to a board meeting, he'd always say, Good afternoon. His chopper used to land him outside the building wherever we were. So I, good afternoon. I apologize for being a couple minutes late. But this guy, his claim to fame was, they were for years and years and years, the Dutch government, this is before the Euro, this is uh, when they were Dutch guilders, the Dutch government was trying to get him to pay taxes. Well, he lived in the uh, Dutch Antilles, so that's why he says, why the fuck do you think I moved to the Dutch Antilles? If I wanted to pay taxes, I wouldn't move to the Dutch Antilles. <clears throat> and, uh, and it got to be expensive. He spent a lot of money to fight the government. So then he came up with the bright idea, which has now been uh, replicated since then. I'll take a company public that will just fight the government for my taxes. Okay, not just similar to my taking an option public. And he did. And the government was, so, or the uh, people of the Netherlands were so behind him, he raised a ton of money, more than his tax liability. And he fought. He bought a new jet, you know, and, 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 and the people didn't give a shit because they said, fuck the government. We, we just as well give them money, you know, have him fight you because it was always in the paper, it was always in the news. And he was quite a flamboyant guy. He was one of our board members. And, uh, and he, he was the most flamboyant on the, on the Dutch board. We had some real big hitters, and um, they. Uh, and you know, it was just in the beginning of, you couldn't smoke in places. And these guys are smoking like $300 Cuban cigars, and they mean they can't smoke. The, at the Amsterdam Hotel, which is arguably the best hotel in the Netherlands, arguably the best hotel in Europe. Uh, and I'm a member, and I don't remember the Amstel Club, which is a, it's a club where all like uh, Heineken and all these guys belong. And he says, I mean, what's like, if you can't smoke a fucking cigar, in a hotel, in a restaurant, after a drink, what the fuck's life all about? So they didn't give a shit. They just smoked cigars in the restaurants, fucked around, and all of them had good-looking uh, blonde bimbo bitches. I mean, it was... The 90s was okay in the 90s. And I was privileged to be part of it. Now, last night, um, we saw a 40-minute film on Discovery Channel, or a copy thereof, on fear. Uh, and uh, we had one resident dentist, and there, I know there were some scenes about dentistry in it. Uh, and um, the, I don't happen to be afraid of dentists. And you know, uh, and I used to get fillings without Novocaine, mm -hmm. without. You know, I used to fill my teeth when I was younger. Uh, it didn't bother me. So, uh, but the um, the whole idea that we talked about yesterday morning and then it was replicated partially in much more detail yesterday evening in the film, was that we're genetically coded to, you know, some of the things that we do. Uh, and, that, and then, of course, at the end, they make you all feel good by saying, but that makes you human. Well, that's a load of shit. Being human, there's, there's a great line, a slide coming up. Pat Riley, who used to be the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, when they won two or three world championships, he said, uh, if you're going to err on the side of being human, you're going to fucking lose. So I, I wanted to cut that. I forgot to tell Megan to cut that last part out. <laughs> because being human doesn't get you much. Of course, I don't have empathy or sympathy, so I mean, so that's my, my side of the continuum, yes. Would you, would you say that uh, smarter people learn fears faster? Um, no, I would say, like that slide from the uh, 159 IQ guys is, they learn it quicker, but they seem to make the same mistakes. So you, intellectually, the smarter people in the room can understand where they, um, their, the, the flaws are in their own character, so to speak, the fear flaws. Uh, but whether you can do it or not, it has nothing to do with the intellectual IQ, it's your emotional IQ. And putting yourself into situations where you're afraid uh, and where you, 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 get, you tense up and you get anxious and you might get dry mouth or you might get perspire. Uh, the, um, 
uh, I remember uh, when I had my shoulder repaired, titanium shoulder, I was on these pain pills that used to make me perspire. And uh, the, uh, and I remember going to meetings and um, I'd be perspiring and everybody would think that I was nervous. So I had to stop taking the goddamn pain pills because, you know, I was sending the wrong message. But I remember, this reminds me, I had a, after I got hurt in 1999, I almost killed myself down uh, doing a dune buggy with my sons, um, I had a meeting with Klaus Kleinfeld of Siemens in Frankfurt. <coughs> and when I, um, uh, Vinica, my Dutch partner, met me, and uh, she picked me up at the airport, and I'm in a wheelchair. Uh, and I'm wearing a running suit like uh, Richard Branson used to wear, jogging suit. And it hurt me to straighten my neck out. So I, it was like this. And I had all this stuff on my shoulder. And so they wheeled me into this fancy restaurant in uh, Frankfurt. And I remember the managing partner, Price Waterhouse, was there. Um, and uh, Klaus Kleinfeld and a couple others. And they wheeled me in. And um, I couldn't straighten my head. I said, hi. And, um, and Klaus is a very empathetic guy. Oh my God, Dan, you know, yeah. And he said, why are you here? What happened? And I told him, and I said, Klaus, I told you I'd be here. Unless I'm fucking dead or in a motherfucking coma, I'm here. So just forget that I'm in a wheelchair, forget I can't straighten my neck, and forget I'm talking a little crooked, but I'm here. Because when I tell you I'm going to do something, I fucking mean it. I don't mean if it's, if I feel like it, or if my kids don't get run over by a car, or yada, yada, yada. I mean it, because I'm going to fucking be there. And you don't hardly meet anybody like that anymore. You know, if there's too much traffic, or I miss my plane. I can't tell you how many times I've chartered planes because I missed the plane. Now, I told you about the story where I fell asleep three times, where I didn't have to be there. So, I mean, I finally got there in time for the meeting. But I've chartered planes. I've chartered helicopters. I used to have a chopper a helicopter here. But that's the difference. It's like one of the guys that came into the May seminar, who sat right where you're sitting, uh, who's got some real emotional baggage. And so, I, I, and I know Robert knows this, and Sally knows this, but I feel an additional obligation to try to help him through his problems. Um, and uh, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, w uh, with him on the phone or with emails or etc. Because I feel an obligation. Being a professional, as Alistair Cook said, the famous British broadcaster, is being a professional is doing your job very well even when you don't feel like it. Even when you feel. Now, my arthritis is bad, but it's not so bad. But there's been times when I couldn't stand up. But I had a speaking engagement. There's been times I showed up, I spoke in Chicago once for 17 hours straight, and I had 105 temperature. Everybody thought that I was sweating and my clothes were all dripping wet because I was all fired up. It's because I had 105 temperature. 17 hours I'm on my feet with 105 temperature. You'd roll up and you'd be in the hospital. That's the difference. And that's why when I see the young kids from New York City who go to the schools, they're all cunts. I can eat them alive. A whole room full of them. And the big guys that we've talked about so far can do the same as me. And that's why it's a joke. Like I told you, there was 25 of them and only Sally and myself. It wasn't a fair fight. We kicked your fucking ass. And that's why I did the whole when we get to the dream team. That's the whole concept of the dream team. Because you're all cunts. Of varying degrees. Either because you got no self-esteem or you got no balls or you got no brains or a combination of all three. And that's what the dream team's for. Because if you get in a room with Donald Trump, it, I don't care if there's 50 of you. It ain't a fair fight. It just isn't. Back to the fear. What did you learn 
if anything, I'm hoping you learned something, about, and I don't, I don't want you to share the secret moments of your life <laughs> and your little secret phobias. And, you know, like, like you like being on top, or I'm not interested in that shit. <laughs> what, what I am interested in is, uh, to the, the best you can, because I'm going to ask them to talk one-on-one, -on -one, the best you can without embarrassing yourself in front of people. See, I embarrass myself. I don't give a shit, because I don't give a shit what you guys think. So, I can tell you. I'll tell you right now what, what I get, uh, came away with the thing, and I've looked at the film three times. Um... Three and a half, because I only watched about half of it last night with you, because I was doing some work, and I came back and watched the end. I knew almost everything in that film already. I didn't know the sections. Uh, I know that um, when you get fray, uh, fear and flight, the, the, your, 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 uh, uh, your back brain uh, uh, shuts down. Uh, and I know that uh, why we revert to our caveman uh, in instincts. And the interesting thing about it is, see, we were all, a couple million years ago, or whatever the time frame, we all had the killer instinct, okay, when it was the right time. If it was a big, huge animal, flight. Or we got a bunch of dudes together with spears, you know, and jockeyed around, and threw rocks at it, and killed it, okay. But we knew. Now, see, you still have those primal instincts. Your parents and grandparents and everybody else, except for the Germans, you know, some of the Germans that used to swing from trees that killed Romans and shit like that a few thousand years ago, you suppressed them. And now it's even worse because you've become politically correct, which is a euphemism for being a cunt. I'm a lot of things, but I mean, I never want to be called politically correct. You want to insult me? You want to start a fight? That's all you got to tell me. My kids tell me I'm not politically correct. I mean, it makes me berserk. A product of my loins could tell me I'm not politically correct. Because I don't want them to be politically correct. And so, of course, Sally and my ex-wife said, well, you sent them to the best schools, and they went to prep schools, and they went to uh, uh, finishing school, and all this other shit. And so well, how, how can you expect anything other than what you got now? Which is true. If we had stayed in East L.A. in the barrio, where that picture was taken, and not lived in a goddamn castle, they wouldn't be so goddamn politically correct. Because when the guys, you know, at the beginning of the film, when the guy goes to rob you, the black dude with the tattoos is going to rob you, or the Hispanic, dark Hispanic, with a, remember, in the movie The Fear? Well, he's not politically correct. He doesn't understand. All he knows is put a knife in your gut, or a cap in your ass. Well, see, because I came from there, I understand that. So I... To me, when I see that film, it shows, one, how far I've come, but I'm fortunate enough to still maintain my primal instincts. You try to shove your primal instincts under the table, because you're embarrassed by them. You might think, I'd like to kill that fucker, but what if somebody hears me and they put it on YouTube and... These big guys, and when we start going through the profiles of Bill Gates, and there's a great slide, and I think Robert gave it to me a couple of years ago, and he's saying, he's on, he's in the, when they were trying to break up, uh, the, the Supreme Court was trying to break up, um, the Justice Department was trying to break up Microsoft, because it was, they said it was a monopoly or whatever it was. And he's on the stand, and the lawyer is grilling him, and he's reading emails that Gates uh, wrote, and words to the effect, and uh, I'm just going to paraphrase, I may get him a little wrong. I want to rip his fucking lungs out and shove it up his wife's ass. He was talking about Ellison from Oracle. And so the lawyer is saying, hey, Mr. Mr. Gates, exactly what you mean? You're going to rip his heart out and shove him up whose ass? And of course, Gates had been trained, you know, and, uh, you know, and they won the case. They didn't break up the Microsoft. But that's how the guys think. And I'm not, nothing against Gates. And I'm not, nothing like that. I don't mean it that way. He was fighting for his baby. Microsoft is his baby. If you want to take my fucking baby away, you better kill me. And that's why when the billion dollar uh, Romanian uh, gypsies are talking about billion dollar, they don't find that I'm a, one of the 300 Spartans. They don't have a fucking clue being a 300 Spartan. Spartans will eat you fucking gypsies alive. 
It would take one gyp, 5,000 gypsies and one Spartan. And he'd come up and he'd still be hungry because he ate you all. So when Bill Gates and these guys say these things, and they do these things, and Microsoft in the early years was ruthless. It's some ugly shit. And they got away with it all. Henry, of course, they, they, they look at Henry Ford, what a bad guy. He took uh, 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 mercenary guys with baseball bats to beat up the poor guys from the unions. What a bad guy. Well, that's no different, except now they do it in court. Now they bring you to your knees in court. So to me, I got the fact that I'm happy that I still have my primal instincts. And that's what makes me who I am. And all these other guys. We're going to talk about Donald Trump's uh, road to come, his comeback that he's had three or four of in his 30-year career. And one of his, he says, always get even. Don't take vacations, always get even. And have a good prenup. Those are three of his eight. <laughs> okay? Now what does that sound like, always get even? Michelle, what does that mean to you, always get even? Mr. Trump, God bless him, believes in retribution. So do I. You fuck with me, you got a major problem. Because I'm not a wussy little Wall Street Wharton guy who's going to wave his finger at you. I'm going to fuck you where you breathe. And that's the difference. So does anybody, are you all just going to mouse up like wussy pussies? Does anybody get anything from the fear film? Can you relate to yourself? Anybody here? For sure. Yeah, I mean, it just in my experience from the financial markets, I realized that traders are manipulated, their beliefs are fucked. And basically, you know, people are scared to buy the bottom of the market. People are, people are scared to jump in when it looks the, the horrible. People run like pussies when the blood is in the streets. So, you know, when, when, when learning this kind of this craft and this trade, you realize that you've been a victim to that. You feel all your senses out the window. Everything you came into the market with, your strategy, your techniques, useless. So. When, and what, uh, I haven't owned a stock in, uh, since I was bought out in 1997, my last shares at the, as the biggest shareholder of Great Western. Uh, I don't believe in the stock market. The reason I don't believe in the stock market, people talk about inflation and you can't keep up with inflation. You think about it. The market is up about uh, 60% since the lows. Uh, you know, we got down to six, 7,000 and now we're back up to 13, 14,000. Now it's about 100%, 90, 80, 90%. So if you put in, in simple numbers, if you put in a million dollars, if you were lucky and if everything's equal, which it isn't, you might make a million by now. So you'd have two million. So what? What the who gives a fuck? So you doubled your money in four years. The odds are you're not going to double your money again in the next four years. So, but there's just as good a chance if the EU collapses that the stock market's going to go back to 7,000 again. Why go through the aggravation? Because you never hear the big wealthy, the super wealthy guy said, oh, I made 18% on my money last year, or I made 20%, or I made 6%. 6% of nothing still nothing. You put, you put, you put up $100,000 and you make a million, uh, 100,000 euros, and you make 800 or 900 or a million euros in three years, you know, you're not going to do that in the stock market, even if you buy on the uh, panic lows. Even if you bought on the, the panic of the uh, 25 years ago was the anniversary of the big crash of 87, which I lived to. Uh, and even if you put all your money in at the, the day the market was down 23%, even today, you'd only about doubled your money, maybe tripled your money in 25 years. And since most people have $50,000 portfolios, $300,000, I'm talking about people that have some, a little money, maybe, maybe you got a million dollar portfolio, maybe you got a two million dollar portfolio. So is the difference between one million and two million going to change your life? No. Now, is the difference between one or two million and a hundred million going to change your life? Yeah. 
when you put up $60,000 and you make 50 million pounds in three and a half months, that changed my life. And that's why I don't fuck around with the stock market. Because, you know, the aggravation, because I like to win. So now I'm watching the stock market. I got enough things to do on my plate without having to watch the stock market now. So, I mean, Benoit, you know, he could relate. It was, it was a good analogy, a good, a good comparison. Any, anybody else about fear? Well, I would say fear is normal, and uh, I should use, uh, everybody should use it uh, to go forward and accept it. And uh, at the end, if you come to a deal or whatever, um, you have to accept your fear, and you have to accept that the other side also has fear and uh, use it as advantage. That's a good example. I was just going to say that. I was hoping you'd say that. He and I have been talking about like the, the real estate deal you did. Okay. And he had some trepidations. First of all, I hadn't done it before. Uh, and what he talked me to. And the thing about fear is, if you talk about it, it's very cathartic. But you're embarrassed to talk about it. Okay. Like I, I've known a lot of women, a lot of my mentees have had, had their first kid. They're apprehensive, you know. Being pregnant, going to the first trimester, second trimester, all this bullshit, water breaking. I've been through all that shit. Not just with my wife. I, I know a lot of the girls I know uh, have gone through it. It's, you know, first time. I, I know I have friends uh, that have had seven, eight, nine kids. Ah, it's like taking a shit. <laughs> you know, seven, eight, nine I mean, after the second or third time, who gives a shit? Pun intended. You know? Who get you know? And, uh, but I use it and at the very tail end, you, you hit it on it. I use it, your fear against you. Yeah. My fear um, was getting up in front of people and publicly speaking, Dan. And that came from a long time ago where I got up in front of about 200 people and froze and couldn't speak for about. 60 seconds, and that... Seemed thing. like six hours, didn't oh, it? Oh, Jesus Christ, I th thought I was going <laughs> to die and sweat my... just melt right where I was at, and yeah. the manager was there. It was just, it was terrible. That fear of getting up in front of people just... It's haunted me for years. I went to the to the uh, Dale Carnegie, tried to take all those uh, things, won the award for it for the best, largest business and stuff like that and everything, but still had that public fear. Before I came here... I was able to get up and speak in front of about 60 people and I practiced and I practiced and I practiced what I was going to say and I was very comfortable with what I was going to do and it just, it was seamless. Yeah, you know, and uh, Robert's going to talk in a couple of days, a few days and uh, by his own admission he's not a world class public speaker but he, you'll say he, he does a good job but I mean he's apprehensive about it, correct? Yeah, yeah okay. He's getting better, you know. Uh, and uh, the uh, but the only way you get better is you got to do it. <laughs> yeah. You got to do it. And um, the uh, it's like playing golf in the, if you don't play golf in the rain or in the wind, which are are, are are fun times to play golf. You never get good at playing golf in the wind, and you'll never play golf well in the wind in in in, in, in the rain. So you got to do it. So when it's out, when I first moved here, I mean the rain would go sideways. I mean, 40, 50 mile an hour winds, wind going sideways, and uh, I go up to Carnoustie, I had my own caddy, Johnny, uh, and, um, and the uh, first few times I showed up in the rain and he said, oh, I wasn't sure you were going to make it, sir. I said, when I tell you I'll be here, I gave my same speech, this is 25 years, unless I'm dead or in a coma, I'm going to be here. So he's carrying my clubs and we're fighting the wind up the first hole of Carnoustie like this, and... Uh, and then there'd be a little spot of sunshine out there. And a typical Scott, he'd say, Ah, oh, it's going to be a bonny day. What the fuck? Has he lost his mind? You know, you can't even stand up because the wind is so strong. And I wasn't used to playing in the wind. And, you know, you lose your balance and you can't... It's going to be a bonny day because he was an eternal optimist. He was. Okay, God rest his soul. In my caddy for about 10 years. A little spark of sun, but up here, a little, little bit of sunshine... A hole in the clouds is a big fucking deal. Because as you see, this morning I got up, the lights were on. The outside lights, flood lights were on. I said, somebody must have left the lights on last night. And then I realized, no, it's because you can't see because it's still dark. Well, during the winter, the real winter, the sun goes down about 3.30-ish, quarter to four, and the sun doesn't come up till 9.30-ish, 
quarter to ten. So it's dark. Um, but fear, just remember that when you're on the other side of the table. They're just as afraid as you are. Mm -hmm. And the little bankers that you deal with are even more afraid. Because they're afraid of making a mistake. And if you can rock them back on their heels and get on the offensive, as we will in the role playing, you're going to succeed. Okay, yes. Oh, I just wanted to add something. Is this, is this, is this a gypsy type deal? Uh, you, is this a legitimate question? I hope not. Okay, no, I mean, go ahead. It was just an observation. I noticed that uh, most people are not aware of their fears. They're afraid, but they're not aware that they're afraid. Correct. Uh, so, a very simple thing to do is just to try to, I don't know, keep a log of your fears. Just when something okay. happens, be aware. And uh, it's, it's funny because. Um, 99% of the stuff that's on the list is irrational. It's not about getting killed by uh, traffic. It's about what someone might say, or what my mom would think, or am I going to fail, am I going to lose all the money? And this is not rational. So yeah. if you're going to lose it all, who cares, Yeah, right? yeah. And one, one of the differences between guys, you know, that we talk about, Mr. Trump and these other guys, and myself, is, you know, I've been broke a few times, uh, and I know that I've, see, I have confidence in my abilities. I, I know I can make the money back again. <clears throat> that's a big difference. When you don't think you can make the money back again, then you really worry. And that's why I continue to tell people, let's just close the fucking thing down and start over again. One, I think to myself, it'll give me something to do. You know? Keep me out of the gym. You know? Uh, and, uh, you know, in my time I've recruited probably 10,000 people interviewed and recruited, trained, 10,000 more or less. And uh, it keeps you focused. If your focus is all you want to do is build a good company instead of fix, we're going to talk about structure. Structure follows strategy. I'll say it now. Structure follows Strategy, not strategy follows structure. And what we do and why 95% of most measures and acquisitions don't work, the AOL one is the premier fuck up of recent years, uh, is because you're buying something and then you try to fix it. What you ought to do is if you buy for the, you, first of all, you shouldn't buy it for the shares because you've got all the liabilities with it. You should buy it for the assets. Can all the people if you can and rebuild from scratch.